So I'm sure it's a very unfamiliar territory for most people. Um, Brazil, not really on the wine map until very, very recently. And it's a great chance tonight to get to know at least some of the wines and some of the some of the things that make Brazil an interesting wine country that's kind of one of the burgeoning new countries in the world scene for, for producing wine. Uh, a lot of that will become clear as we go through the presentation, but let's start with the geography. Um, let's establish exactly where Brazil is and where the winemaking takes place and what's kind of special about this country and its terroir. So Brazil, by far the largest country in South America, uh, the world's fifth largest country, actually, just very slightly smaller than the whole of the United States put together. It's about 9.5 million square kilometers as opposed to Brazil's 8.5. You could fit around 19 UKs into the size of Brazil. So a massive country, um, 211 million people live in it. It's also a very populous country, the sixth most populous country in the world. Um, so a big, important country for all sorts of reasons, uh, which I guess um, might, in one level, make it slightly surprising why we haven't heard of their wines before. But the explanation for that will become kind of clear as we go through the evening and through the presentation. What are our images of Brazil? Well, certainly fine wine's not one of them. Um, I guess the kind of main image that a lot of us might have will be the beaches of Rio and the sunshine and the carnival and all of that kind of joyous Brazilian uh, atmosphere that we see on television, the kind of sun-kissed beaches. If not that, then perhaps it's the Amazon rainforest, the sheer kind of exotic nature of the rainforest, the tropical jungle, the weird and wonderful animals, the primitive people that are yet to be discovered living up in the upper reaches of the Amazon. Uh, a lot, of, a lot of us kind of think of Brazil in those terms. Uh, the gauchos shared between Argentina and Uruguay and Brazil, these kind of wild open spaces with lots of cattle farming, uh, another image of Brazil that we might have, or even the favelas, these uh, slums, these shantytown slums that have grown up around the big cities like Sao Paulo and are featured in the news a lot because of the drug and gang violence in the cities. Now, all of that is really kind of far removed from our image of winemaking. You know, if we think about France or Italy or Spain or Germany, uh, you know, those, those images, which are very distinct of Brazil, have nothing to do with wine production. And there's a very good reason for that. If we look at the country again, it's divided into 26 states. And if I expand that slightly, um, of those 26 states, some of them, the names will be quite familiar, uh, like Rio de Janeiro down there on the coast and the Amazonian region up in the northwest. We have kind of um, Costa Rica and Panama feeding down there, all full of the tropical jungle, the rainforest and the kind of exotic side of Brazil. And indeed, if we look at where the equator lies, it begins to tell the story of why Brazil is not one of the major wine producing countries. The equator there, uh, Brazil running from around four degrees north of the equator down to about 33, 34 degrees south of the equator. Now, the vast majority of that land is not in what we would regard as a wine making country. Uh, one state in particular called Rio Grande do Sul is responsible for 90% of all of Brazil's fine wine. And by fine wine, I mean it's bottled wine rather than just wine being sold in bulk. And it's wine made from the Vitis vinifera grape, which is the European wine grape, the one from which the world's quality wines are all made. There are a couple of other uh, genus of Vitis, of grapevines, which we'll talk about a little bit more. But in terms of fine wine made from the recognized fine wine grapes, this one state of Rio Grande do Sul makes 90% of the entire production. Uh, there's a little pockets of winemaking all over Brazil, small ones, some in Santa Catarina, 
the state just above Rio Grande do Sul, which you can see there. They've got a, a reasonable wine production. This is the other 10% are scattered around Brazil. And the surprising one, which we'll look at a little bit more maybe up in this Bahia state, is called the Valle de São Francisco, which is a way up in tropical country, but is quite an important, the second most important wine producing area. Now, it's important in terms of volume. So far, not so much in terms of quality. Uh, we're not tasting wines from there tonight, and I'll talk some more. Actually, in week two, we're going to take a little look at Bahia. Although we're not tasting wines from there, I thought it'd be quite interesting to look at this very, in some ways, peculiar wine producing area up there, much more towards the kind of tropical equatorial part of Brazil. But thinking again about Rio Grande do Sul and blown, uh, uh, it's the most southerly state of Brazil, as you, could, as you can see. Uh, just to its west is Argentina, and just to its south is Uruguay. And if we blow up the kind of picture of it in a moment, you'll see uh, where the wine production takes place. But first of all, more generally, you can see that it's roughly in the same latitudes as the main wine growing regions of Argentina and Chile. And uh, most of the wine growing on, in Argentina is based around Mendoza, a little bit much further north in Salta, a little bit a bit further south in Patagonia. And the same for Chile, the vast majority of its vineyards around the capital city of Santiago. And all those famous Chilean regions, Maipo and Coshawa and all of those things you may have heard of, all based around there. So this bottom state, this furthest south state of Brazil, uh, not too far from those in terms of latitude, which gives you one of the reasons why it's the state where wine is produced. And indeed, if we look at those lines of latitude 30 to 50 south, these are traditionally 30 to 50 south and 30 to 50 north are the latitudes in which the textbook says you can only make fine wine. And if we expand that up to look at the world and keep those same lines of latitude, you'll see that for Chile and Argentina, the bulk of the country is within the 30 to 50 south latitude, as is South Africa and the south of Australia and New Zealand. And the same in the north, you know, if you look across that band of 30 to 50 north, you'll see that all the places that we think of as wine producing countries are within those bands. Um, but Brazil, only a tiny fraction of it is, the rest of it is too close to the equator for traditional winemaking uh, because it's too hot and too humid and the vines don't ripen properly, suffer from too much disease and don't get a chance to kind of rest and retain their acidity. So that's why wine is not made towards the tropics, although there are these exceptions in Brazil which we'll come to. But it does explain that this little area of uh, Rio Grande do Sul is the prime area for wine production and especially a, a kind of sub-region of Rio Grande do Sul called Serra Gaucha. I believe the pronunciation is actually Gaucha in uh, Portuguese, but uh, I just say Gaucha because it's in my brain. So Serra Gaucha, they're in the kind of east of the Rio Grande do Sul state. And you can see there's maybe a couple of reasons why it's such a big player. If Rio Grande do Sul makes 90% of all Brazil's fine wine, this one little part of it is responsible for 80% of all fine wine. So an extremely important uh, little area. And a couple of reasons for that. One is probably that it is further towards the coast and that proximity to the ocean probably mitigates some of the heat a little bit, keeps a little bit of freshness with some breezes from the coast. And also, just in practical terms, it's very close to a major port of Brazil called Porto Alegre, where if they're going to um, export their wines, it has to get out of the country some way. And the infrastructure of the south of Brazil is not that great. The roads, the trains, all the rest of it, this massive country. So sailing the wines out and up towards uh, North America or over to Europe, uh, is, is important to have a port and it's very close to Porto Alegre. So a couple of reasons why Serra Gaucha is such a prime and important position. 
uh, winemaking uh, region rather. And if we go on again and look at it in a bit more detail, Serra Gaucha, uh, the industry centers around this town of Bento Gonzalez. It's the kind of capital of the industry. The wine, there are vineyards all around it, but it's mostly important because that's where all the business happens. That's where the wineries have their headquarters and where the business has been happening for 150 years. The wine road the, with this giant barrel, the wine route, if you want to go and visit the wineries there, starts for most people in Bento Gonzalez too, the most important town. But in terms of the landscape, it's mainly made up of clay and sand soils over basalt. Now basalt's a volcanic rock and makes this area quite interesting because a lot of people who get into the soil types, the terroir of wine, are quite intrigued by volcanic soils, by basalt soils. Uh, we get them in places like Mount Etna, the slopes of there, uh, places like Basilicata, which is named after the basalt soils in the south of Italy, and um, all over Chile, up in places like Washington State, there's a lot of soils made from uh, volcanic uh, rock, which people think give quite an interesting aspect to wine. So Serra Gaucha has that in its favor. It's a land mostly of small holdings. People, a bit like, you know, kind of uh, sharecroppers, small subsistence farmers who just have a couple of hectares of vines and most of them just hand their fruit over to a local cooperative who makes the wine for them. But we are seeing more and more uh, small artisan boutique producers who have their own estate vineyards and make their own wine. And that's really what we're focusing on in the next couple of weeks is a couple of those uh, small artisan family owned producers. The land itself is has a bit of altitude from about 250 meters rising to about 750 meters. And as many of you will know, especially if you've done my um, tastings before, uh, for every 100 metres of elevation that you go up, you drop around one third of one degree centigrade in average temperature. So if you're up there at 750 metres, you've dropped about five degrees in temperature from down in the valley floor, which is very important to viticulture in a hot area, in a humid area, because rising up, it gets cooler and drier. So vineyards at some altitude are very important here in Brazil. And it's said also that this volcanic basalt soil is also very good at retaining acidity in vines, which is one of the reasons this area can produce high quality wines, combination of soils and altitude. Um, this is a statue which is in Serra Gaucha, a statue commemorating the Italian immigrants who settled in the area in the 19th century. And one of the questions that um, you might ask yourself, which I also pondered when I first came across Brazilian wines, is why there wasn't more Portuguese influence. Portugal colonized Brazil back in the 16th century, and of course has a great um, tradition of wine making. But in fact, we see very few Portuguese varieties being grown in Brazil, and we see more Italian and more recently French varieties. And that all stems from the fact that the Italians in the 19th century, and we're going to go over this timeline again next week, just to kind of come back and focus on how wine developed. But the Italians really put winemaking on the map. And we're the first to plant uh, grape, grape vines in Serra Gaucha. At those times, they soon found out that the European vines struggled to grow in those hot and humid conditions, the, the Italian grape varieties that they would have brought with them. So instead, they mostly planted hybrid grapes and Vitis labrusca. Now, Vitis labrusca is another one of these, of the species of vine grape. It's quite common in the Eastern United States, things like Concord and Isabel are the grape varieties. They don't make the finest wines, um, but they are very good at ripening in conditions that don't really suit the European wine grape. So a lot of these yellow grapes that are planted in Brazil were those or hybrids, which are crosses between Vitis vinifera and Vitis labrusca. So they were trying to find something that would actually thrive and grow and survive in these conditions. 
Another thing about the area, the Sierra Gaucha area, is that it is a long tradition of making sparkling wines. A lot of that tradition came from the Italians who settled there, especially a lot of settlers came from the north of Italy, where those wines like Prosecco and Spumanti, Asti Spumanti and so on, were very popular. So a lot of great variety, a lot of the wine production was sparkling wine, and the Brazilians love a party and love a celebration, so that fed the local market too. These days, there are also a lot of traditional method sparkling wines or champagne method sparkling wines, and a lot of that was kind of instigated by the influx of money coming into Brazil just over the last 30 or 40 years, including Moe Chandon, who established a big domain Chandon Brazil to make quality traditional method or champagne method sparkling wines in the 1970s. So that's a kind of run through why Brazil has this one small enclave of winemaking and Next week, we're going to go in a lot more to why it took so long for winemaking to really take grip and become established in Brazil. But this week, I didn't want to overload us with facts and figures. So I thought we would stop at that point to taste our first wine or to talk about our first wine, then taste it. And some of these other uh, questions and facts about Brazil will surely be kind of teased out over the course of tonight and next week. So our first wine is a sparkling wine, um, suitably enough. And it is one made by the Charmat method. You'll see it says that in front of the bottle. In a moment, I'm going to explain more about that. 